Here in Kansas, we have storms quite often, don't we? Whether it's a tornado in the middle of summer or snowgeddon in the middle of winter. Whether we get caught in a storm that is rampant and we're fearful. Or maybe it's a storm that we just have to, you know, deal with. Just go through the motions and just wait for the storm to pass. But sometimes those storms can cause fear within our life that we have no control over. Hunkering down in our basement, fearful of what's going to take place. I remember when I first became pastor here back in 1999, we had this big tornado that came through and missed our church for about a block away. And, and uh, all the older members of the church were saying, oh, please miss the church, miss the church. And I was saying, please hit the church, please hit the church. Let's get insurance and let's pay for this and let's start all over again. And, and it missed our church for about a block and it caused some major havoc and damage to uh, the area. And even loss of lives. Sometimes when the storm comes, sometimes it is devastating to our lives. But how do we stay calm in the midst of the storm? And we're talking not only a physical storm that maybe we're going through because of the weather. But I believe more importantly than a physical storm that we go through, it's the life storms that we have to learn how to deal with. Whether it's financial or whether it's relational. Or maybe it's our kids, or maybe it's just our personal life. There's storms that rage every day. Those storms may be raging to you and you alone. Maybe nobody in this world knows the storms that you're going through. But inside of that storm, your heart, your mind, and your life is captivated by fear. How do we deal with with the storms of life. I believe in Mark chapter 4. Jesus gives us a wonderful story. And he talks about a weather event. And we're going to tie that weather event. Into how to stay calm. And have peace. In the midst of the storm. Let me set this up. Right before Jesus gets in the boat. And goes to the other side. He just did the feeding of the 5,000 men. Plus women and children. He had a little bit of fish. And a little bit of loaves of bread. And he compounded that in order to feed 5,000 men, boys, girls, and women. He was exhausted. He was tired. He wanted to prove to his disciples that there was nothing that he did not have control over. Not even food. And now he's going to prove to the people that he has power over the elements. There's nothing that Jesus has no control over. And it's found in Mark chapter 4. It says, on the same day when evening had come, he said to them, let's cross over to the other side. We just fed the 5,000. There's a multitude of people. There's things that are taking place. I'm exhausted. I've been working hard. I've been spiritually spent and I'm helping people out. I'm healing the sick and I'm causing major issues. And he said, I'm tired. Let's go to the other side. Let's leave these people alone and let's go to the other side. Now, when they had left the multitudes... They took him along in the boat as he was. Now, those three words, as he was. Jesus, being man, had the same issues that you have and I have. We get tired. And Jesus was physically spent. He was exhausted. So the disciples took him as he was and the other little boats were also with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves beat into the boat so that it was already filling with water. But he was in the stern, asleep on a pillow, which represents peace. It represents calmness. And they awoke him, and they said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Then he rose and rebuked the wind, and he said to the sea, Peace. Be still. And the wind ceased. And I like this next phrase. And there was a great calm. After the storm, there can be a great calm. But he said to them, why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? And they feared exceedingly and said to one another, 
Who can this be that even the winds and the sea obey him? Peace be still in the midst of a storm. In the midst of your storm. In the midst of the calamity that you're going through. In the midst of chaos. When you look at your family and you look at your life. And you look at your finances and you look at and you say, how, how am I going to get out of this storm? And sometimes those storms become so overwhelming to us that we just really don't know what to do. So in your mind, I want you to think about whether it is a relational, a physical, financial, or a personal storm that you're going through that maybe nobody knows or maybe a close group of people are ministering with you and to you, and, but that storm is captivating your life. And I want to share a few things about how those storms take place and what we do within those storms. And then I want to finish up with an application to those. The first thing is they're inevitable. Your storm is inevitable. Whether it is now that you're going through that storm or whether it's tomorrow you're going through the storm or you just got out of the storm, storms are going to take place. They are inevitable. They take place with the just and the unjust. They take place with people that love Jesus and people that don't love Jesus. Storms take place. And just because you're a child of God doesn't mean that you're exempt from the storms of life. We have storms. We have death. And we have life. And sometimes those storms are inevitable. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 45, it says, That you may... Be the sons of your fathers in heaven. For he makes the sun rise on the evil and on the good. And sends rain on just and on the unjust. Things going to take place. And it's inevitable. All you have to do is wake up in the morning. And you know that there could be a storm. It could be a phone call. Your mom passed away. It could be a phone call. Your kid has a major issue within his life. And they're pleading to you. And it may not be your storm, but because you love somebody, their storm becomes your storm. And you're working to help them through their storm. And it's inevitable. When you love, it hurts. And it's inevitable that storms will arise. And then sometimes they're just sudden. Sometimes they just come up. You have, it's inevitable, they're going to take place. But sometimes we don't see them coming. Some storms are predictable, and some storms are just sudden. And that's, you know, Kansas. I'm I, born and raised in Kansas, so this is the only place I've really lived except for a few times down in, in Texas. But you know the thing that is very unique about the weather in Kansas, I would say, is tornadoes. It's because a tornado could pop up and tear up your house, and I live one block away and skip over my house. It could hit you, and it won't even touch me. Now, it may affect me, but it doesn't cause damage to me. Sometimes they're sudden. We just watched a few years ago down in Joplin, where right after a graduation, a major tornado came through and demolished the entire city. It happened so quickly. They were just getting out of the graduation. Multitudes of people got hurt. Damage into the millions it was sudden. It was sudden. So sometimes when we look at those sudden storms, I would say the biggest sudden storm that we have is sometimes our relationships and sometimes our health. We go through a storm just like that. We start feeling pain. Maybe our kid starts getting dizzy or having headaches. And we go to the doctor and the doctor says, you need to come back in. The news isn't necessarily good. And the life that you had in your mind for your life or your child's life has just changed. Everything from that time of the storm is changed. Are you ready for that? Nobody's ready for that sudden storm. You know, because we know storms sometimes come up suddenly, in most cases, when the storms come up suddenly, we are not prepared for that storm. Now, if we, if we lived on the coast and we saw the hurricane coming out 100 
miles away or 200 miles away, and we had a week and a half to prepare for that storm. Guess what? Lowe's would be empty. Walmart would be empty. The, the grocery stores would be empty because we'd have time to go prepare for that storm. But in most cases, those storms that we go through, we are not prepared for because they're sudden. One day everything is great, and the next day your storm is raging. The next day your life is in chaos, and you really don't know what to do, and you really don't know where to go, and you're just holding on. We just feel like we're dog paddling to keep our head above water before we drown because the storm is raging. The storm is overbearing. And because of that, they can be frightening. They can be very downright scary. The disciples said, Master, wake up. Do you not want us to perish? We're, we're dying here. And the disciples did the same thing that you and I do when we become fearful. We start doubting that God cares. The disciples, wake up, Jesus. And he says, guys, didn't you know I have a plan I just showed you yesterday what I was about ready to do. I showed you my power. You're not going to perish. And he stood up in the center of that boat. And he said, peace. And the storm ceased. Calmness took place. And if we've ever been into a storm, the winds are raging. The rain is falling. And then all of a sudden, the clouds roll away. And the sun comes out. And you sense a spirit of calmness. Because you're saying, the storm has passed. The storm has passed. And I believe sometimes that we can have a storm in the midst of our life. And it may be very frightening. But we cannot doubt God in the midst of that storm. Verse 38 of Mark 4, it says, But he was in the stern, asleep on a pillow, which represents peace. And they awoke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? They were scared to death. But then, storms, they are temporary. They are temporary. God will quieten the storm. Now, how can you say that? Because sometimes the storm is so overwhelming. And sometimes even death takes place in the middle of that storm. How? How can that take place? Paul says, for our light affliction, which is just for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. The light affliction he was beaten, he was left for dead, he was shipwrecked, he was stoned. How could he say that? The light affliction is because Paul gave the perspective of this. He knew 70 to 80 years on his life. And he wasn't about to trade in his 70 or 80 years on this life for an eternal reward in heaven. He had a perspective of saying this. I may serve 70 years down on this earth, but I know who I love, and I know who, serves, who I serve. And when I die, I will have eternity in heaven. So what I go through down here is light affliction compared to what is going to take place for me in my eternal life. Storms, they are temporary. You may wake up and you may be frightened today, but when a storm is passed, you can look back and say, I'm glad that was over with. But in those storms, we have to have a purpose. They have a purpose. Jesus led them into the storm. Jesus got in the boat and he said, let us go to the other side. Jesus knew the storm was coming. Jesus knew they were going to be frightened. Jesus knew the storm was going to be overwhelming within their life. And Jesus knew that he was going to teach them the lesson that they have to have faith in God in the midst of the storm. And so often we go through the storm 
And we are fearful of the storm because we do not have a relationship of the God that put us in the storm. The storm itself has a purpose. We do not go through storms for no reason. We go through storms to give God the glory in the midst of the storm. Now, do we like it? Absolutely not. How many of us want to go through a storm today? We don't want to go through storms. But while we're in the storm and they are inevitable and sometimes they're sudden and sometimes they're predictable, what do we learn while we're in the storm? We have to have a purpose. We have to have a learning curve. God will lead us into the storm. And God will build our faith while we're in the storm. In verse 35 it says, On that same day when the evening had come, he said to them, Let us cross over to the other side. In other words, I'm going to put you dead smack into a storm that's going to put you so scared that you have no place to turn but to me. And I believe sometimes when we're in the midst of the storm, Jesus is saying that same thing. He said, you may think I'm asleep. You may think that I'm all peaceful and I'm asleep at the will. But when you're in the midst of the storm, what I need you to do is fall on your knees and you turn to me and wake and let me calm your storm. And when I calm your storm... When I make your life smooth, when things are taking place and you're calling on my name and you realize that I'm the only one that can help you, then, then you're going to learn. Then you have a purpose. So how can you have peace in the storm? Let me give you these three points. And these are something that I think all of us need to have when we're in the midst of the storm. Make sure Jesus is in the boat. When you're in the middle of a storm... Make sure Jesus is in your boat. I've had a lot of funerals and I've had a lot of sick people and Jesus wasn't in their boat. And when Jesus is not in your boat and calamity takes place and storms arise, what do you do? You can ask a thousand questions and you can do a prayers over prayers over prayers. But what we need to know is that Jesus is in the boat. My favorite scripture. I want to dissect it for you real quick. In Romans chapter 8, verse 28. And now, that all things, and now know that all things work together for good to those who love God and to those who are called according to His purpose. Jesus wants to work in your life. These five things we know. It's a fact. We know that God loves us. And we know that God wants to work within us. As a child of God, we have to know in the midst of the storm that Jesus is beside me, that I can pray, I can ask God to help. When death takes place, I know that God is going to be beside me. I know. I don't just hope. I don't just pray for. I know that God is beside me. It is a fact. The second thing, in all things, in all storms, even if it's own our own dealings, even if it's our own problem, we know that in all things and in all storms, God is beside me. Even in your sin, God is on your side. Does he like it? No. He hates sin. But you know what he does? He loves you. And he's going to put you in the storm. Sometimes to get rid of the sin. So you can have the calmness within your life. He will have a purpose within your life. In order to move you. In all things. For the good. In all times. He wants the good. To work within your life. Satan wants you to think it's all bad. We've used this illustration so many times. Here's what Satan does within your life. He takes a snapshot. He takes a picture of the worst time of your life. Your worst time at work. Your relationships. Or even your finances. And he tells you to take a picture of that mentally. And you take that picture and he says, Now I want you to put that on the refrigerator. 
And every time you go to the refrigerator, I want you to know it doesn't get any better than that. This is as good as it's going to get. Satan wants you to get into your mind that there's nothing that will improve within your life. That this is as good as it gets. And sometimes we start believing the lies of Satan. That in the midst of our storm, I have to stay in this storm. I have to stay how I am. I will never get any better. It will always be this terrible. And Jesus saying, forget that. This is a life. That is a picture. You were there, but not any longer. I have been redeemed. I've been bought by the blood of Jesus Christ. You are no longer who you were. I'm in the midst of your storm. I'm going to work all things out for your good. We can't get caught in the lie that it doesn't get any better than this. We get caught in the lie. We start believing Satan. And what we have to understand that God knows who we are. And he wants to work everything out within our life. But here's the deal. Not everybody is in the boat. God isn't in everybody's boat. He says those, those who love him and are called. There's many times that you have Jesus in your boat. And Jesus is going to work within your boat. But not everybody that goes through a storm has Jesus in the boat. We have to make sure that for those who love him and are called, when you are loved by God and you, and you allow God to work within your life and Jesus is in the midst of your boat, how do you know that? Because the Bible says for those who love him, love him, honor him, cherish him. When a storm takes place, we don't run from God. We run to God. When a calamity takes place, we understand, I can't do this on my own. I need God within my life according to his purpose, not your purpose. The storm isn't necessarily for God. The storm is for you to get closer to God for his purpose. When we look at what God wants to do, first and foremost, he wants to make sure he is in your boat. And if he's not in your boat, I would say today before you leave, you need to make sure that you have Jesus in your boat, in your life. Because life stinks sometimes. Calamities take place and storms rage. And if we do not have Jesus in the center of our boat, we will soon capsize. And that life can be very demanding. So the second thing is plan ahead so you'll be prepared for the storm. If the storms will come, we need to prepare for them. Best time to work on your finances is before the storm. Somebody give me an amen. Anthony, give me an amen on that, right? Financial Peace University right there. Listen to 70% of all Americans live from paycheck to paycheck. What happens when a storm hits? What happens when you lose your job? What happens when that deductible takes place and you have to have a $5,000 deductible? And you have $3,000. Guess what you do? Well, let me pull it on a credit card. Now that $3,000 turned into $5,000 because of a 9% interest. What happens? We have to prepare for the financial storms. We have to prepare for them now. Do we ever think that we're never going to have a financial storm? We all know we will. Do we all think we're going to have a relational storm? We will. So it is naive at best to stick our head in the sand and say, it'll happen to 95% of everybody else, but it'll never happen to me. Right? God loves you. But we are in the law of reality. And storms will take place. I can sleep through the storm. I can rage during the storm. I can trust God in the midst of the storm. But the storm, they are going to come. And we need to prepare ourselves for the storm. There's a funny story. Uh, long, this is a Kansas long-term story. But there was an old rancher in western Kansas that uh, his son got married and he moved off. And, and now this older man was by himself and he and his wife. And, and he needed a farmhand. So he put on a local paper, he put an ad on the local paper for a, for a farmhand, some strong young man that would, that would help him bring in the feed and take care of the animals and, and to just make sure his farm was uh, okay, just like his son did, but his son uh, got married and moved away. So he interviewed a few guys, 
And he got this one guy, he came in and, and he said, uh, what, what are your qualifications? He said, I can sleep through the storm. The old man said, what? What, what, what about your farm? What, 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 what do you know how to do? He goes, I'm telling you, I can sleep through the storm. He goes, let me interview some other guys. I think this guy's, you know, not quite uh, who I want. So they waited a couple weeks. And finally, two weeks later, the, the ad came in the paper again. And, and the man came up again. He said, he, said, he said, I want to ask you one more time. What are your qualifications? And he says, I can sleep through the storm. So the old man says, okay, dude, I'm tired of doing this all by myself. So you're hired. And he gave him a bunk and out in the barn. And, and uh, he started working. He was a wonderful worker, hard worker. And then on a Saturday evening, they heard the thunderstorm starting to come in and the lightning come in and, and he knew the storm was coming. So the old man got out of bed and he went down to the bunkhouse and he started knocking on the bunkhouse door and he said, wake up, wake up. We, we've got work to do. We've got to bring the animals in. We've got to take care of the tractor. We've got to make sure everything's taken care of. And, and the guy was asleep and he wouldn't wake up and then he started doing the work by himself and he found out that the animals were already in the barn. The tractor had already been covered. The hay was already in the barn. The man prepared for the storm so when the storm hit he could sleep. Isn't that what we should do in life? If we would prepare before the storm hit we could be calm in the midst of the storm. How are you preparing for your next storm? Build your life. Build your home. On two foundations. You can build your life. And you can build your home. On the foundation of the rock. Or on the sand. Oh the houses will look good. And they will stand. For a certain amount of time. But sooner or later. The waves will come in. Sooner or later. The storm will hit upon that house. And if your house is not built on the rock of Jesus Christ, your house will crumble. The sand or the rock, it all depends on the foundation in which you build your life. We aren't too busy for the storm. We know the storms will come. And the storm is no respecter of person. Whether you're a believer or an unbeliever, your storm of life will hit. So it takes the last point. If the storm does wake you up, be sure to focus on the truth. See, here's where, here's where we fail. We're prepared. Man, we got food in the closet. We've done everything we need to do, and the storms come up, and all of a sudden, the storm catches off guard. And we are awakened. And we are fearful. What do we do? Well, the anxiety and the adrenaline keeps us up. And where do we go? Where do you go in the midst of the storm? Where do you go when you start having anxieties? Where do you go when you start having fear? If you go where most people go, it's right to the front of the line of worst case scenarios. Somebody give me an amen. Worst case scenario. I... I'm going to die. I will never get out of this. This is terrible. I will never recover from this. I'll never be happy again. I will never be the same again. Worst case scenario goes straight to the front of the line. And we start believing the lies of Satan. That say when the storms are here and I wake up. I have no idea what to do. I might as well give up and quit. And so often... Many people do in the midst of their storm. They may not quit life, but they quit caring about life. And when they start stop caring about life, what happens is the storm that they have gone through captivates them to a point that it changes them and what they believe and who they are. And if we allow a storm that's temporary to change who we are and to change our identity and who God wants us to be, we're allowing the storm of this life to change your life. When it wakes you up, when the storm rocks your world, 
what do you do? You have to believe the truth. We're all going to go through storms. We're all going to be fearful in the storms. What do we do? Do we just fall on our knees before God and say, God, protect me? Yes, we can do that. But mentally, what do we do? Philippians chapter 4, verse 8, it says this, Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are noble, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, and if there are anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. In the midst of a storm, we have to meditate on God. What is truth? Because if we go to worst case scenarios without evidence of that worst case scenario, we're listening to the lies of Satan. But when we go through a storm, and I can focus on Philippians chapter 4, and I can say whatsoever things are true, what does God want? Whatsoever things are noble, whatsoever things are just, Whatsoever things are pure and whatsoever things are lovely. Whatever is right, I'm going to put my mind and my heart on those things. Because verse 9 says, The things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do. And I love what it says. And the God of peace will be with you. The God of peace. Not the God of the storm. The chaos, the problems. I'm going to focus what is right. And if I focus what is right in the midst of the storm, I can have the peace of God in the midst of the storm. And if I can have the peace of God in the midst of the storm, I can go through that storm. I can handle that storm. Now, how many of you have ever heard of the Chronological Bible? Anybody heard of the Chronological Bible? It's taking the Bible... As it was written, first, you know, we see Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. We think that's the Pentateuch. So we think, well, Genesis must have been the first book ever written in the Bible, right? Well, it's not. You know the first book that was ever written that was put in the Bible? Job. That's a good place to start. Let me start reading with Job. <laughs> but in the chronological Bible, it talks about the events that take place and the stories and the verses that took place at the events. And this is what I thought was very unique. Psalms chapter 23. We know that psalm. We use that psalm in, in funerals all the time. We'll use it this week at a funeral here for Joe Garcia's mother. We, there's, a, there's a funeral that talks about the Psalms chapter 23. But do you know when Psalms 23 was written? Do you know? This was the psalm that David wrote right before he faced Goliath. He was about ready to go face death. And he wrote this psalm. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures and he leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies and you anoint my head with oil. Two chapters before, David was anointed the very next king of Israel. He was anointed with oil by Samuel. And two chapters later, he's facing Goliath and he knows that God is on his side. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. When you look at what David was going through, he was saying this, I'm going through a valley. I'm going through a storm. I'm going to face Goliath. But I know in the midst of my storm, in the midst of Goliath, I have you. And you're going to be beside me in the valley of the shadow of death. Jesus was in touch with an eternal perspective that he wants us to have. In Romans chapter 15, verse 13. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may bound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. How can I wrap this up? In the midst of your storm that you have, 
that I have. We have to put God where he needs to be. In the midst of a storm that's raging all around us, we have to make sure that Jesus is the priority of our life. In the midst of that storm, when Jesus is all around us, we have to believe that he loves us unconditionally. Just like the disciples were scared of the sea, scared of the storm, scared of the water, and Jesus was sound asleep. When we go to Jesus, and we may not think that he's awake, we may not think he's even around us, and we go on our knees and say, Jesus, I need you. Same thing as shaking him at the, in the boat and saying, Jesus, wake up. Aren't you afraid I'm perishing? And Jesus would do this just like he does it for me, and he'll do it for you. He may rebuke me and say, oh, where's your faith? Do you know I have a plan for you? But then he stands up in the midst of your storm, in the midst of your fears, in the midst of your insecurities, in the midst of your failures, and he'll say this, peace. In the midst of your storm, it may not be that day, it may be a week, it may be a year, maybe a while. But the calmness that Jesus gives to us is something that we cannot comprehend. Because all we see, all we feel, is the storms raging around us. And we start getting the perspective that life stinks, that I'm not in control, God doesn't love me. This storm is too big. My problem is overwhelming. And we start believing the lies of Satan. And we start living up to the potential that Satan wants us to live up to. We live a snapshot. And we start believing the lie. But what we need to do is what the disciples said. Jesus, I need you. And allow Jesus to do something within your life to calm your fears. Calm your life and be with us. I'm going to have an invitation. And uh, what an invitation is, is um, an invitation is for you to respond. Um, first is we have to make sure that Jesus is in our boat. Let me give you, Ed, nobody, it's not a big deal, but how many of you guys are in a storm right now? Raise your hand if you're in a storm. Okay, we, we have storms. And we're in a storm. It may not be your storm. It may be somebody around your storm. It may be somebody in your life. But it's affecting you. I, I need to ask a couple things. Number one, I need to ask, you need to evaluate to make sure Jesus is in your boat. Because if you're going through a storm and Jesus is not in your boat, you're in this thing on your own. And you don't want to go through a storm on your own. But once you find out Jesus is in the boat and you love Jesus... And you cry out to him and say, Lord, I need your help. It makes no difference what storm you're in. Whether it's physical, financial, whether it's your children, whatever the storm is. We need to cry out to God and say, Lord, I need you to take care of my storm. I need you, Lord, I need you to take care of me. I need you to make me start thinking properly. What is true, what is right, what is pure. Instead of the lies that I believe, instead of what people will say, I need to trust in you. Storms? Here's what Jesus said. He was tired. He worked all day. And he said, guys, we're going to get in the boat. And we're going to go to the other side. And on the way to the other side, the biggest storm of their life hit them face on. And Jesus was at peace because he had a bigger plan. We get in the middle of the boat. A storm hits us. All fear, all anxiety, and all stress overcome us. What we need to do in the midst of our storm is go to Jesus. Pray to him and ask him to help you in the midst of your storm.